Welcome back, church family. I hope you have had a great week. I cannot believe we are already in the middle of May, heading toward the end of May. Our uh, school year is about to be up. Just not um, not what I expected at all, but um, I guess that's the same for all of us, right? Got uh, the opportunity to meet with our shepherds on Thursday, and uh, they met to to talk about uh, the reopening plan for our congregation for um, getting back to having uh, in-person services and and so uh, you know in the midst of all that the discussion and the prayers um, you know it, it just became very obvious that these men are very very concerned for our safety for our health um, and for doing things in the right way. And I am, I'm just, I just want to say how grateful I am to all of them for that. You know, the, the Bible tells us that, that the elders are, uh, are to keep watch for the flock, that they are also to protect the flock. And I think these guys are, are really taking that seriously and doing a, doing a great job at that. The Bible also tells us the Hebrew writer told us to, to, obey those who watch over our souls to to cooperate with them to make their burden lighter and so i hope all of us are trying to do that and trying to as they as they work to to encourage us i hope we're all trying to encourage them as well because i think encouragement is something all of us cannot get enough of especially during this time right and so uh this series that we're beginning today i hope will, will be encouraging to you when we're looking at um, Paul's letter to the Philippian church, I think that that idea of encouragement just really comes through. So I think this is a, a really appropriate theme for us to look at. Do you know, um, this isn't the first time in history, of course, that, that um, people have been through a pandemic, an epidemic, an outbreak. Certainly not even the first time in, in our country um, that we have had a widespread um, pandemic like this. Of course, we, a lot of folks have been talking about the, uh, the 1918 um, Spanish influenza that struck um, the entire world, um, killed over 700,000 people in the United States alone, and over 50 million people globally lost their lives as a result of this, this influenza pandemic. Um, and many of the same things, I was, I was going back and reading some different things. Um, it's an excellent article in the Christian Chronicle by John Mark Hicks, um, a historian who, who uh, teaches at Lipscomb. He um, wrote an excellent article about the churches of Christ during this time in Nashville. Um, during the, this time, um, the same sort of things were happening. Businesses were closing. Um, all kinds of um, requirements were being made to try to keep people distant, to try to keep people safe uh, and from becoming um, infected. And, and congregations were asked not to meet, um, just very similar to, to the way we are um, doing today. And um, several congregations in the Nashville area used their buildings for makeshift hospitals because there were not enough hospital beds to accommodate all the patients and members of the congregations worked to to take care of these patients what a what an incredible testimony to the love of jesus that uh, the church's members and ministers and elders and deacons were giving of themselves to serve those who needed their their uh, their blessing at that time, right? Who really needed that? So um, I found that that very very interesting, and 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 I love this quote from. If I can get to it, um, I was supposed to be scrolling through these <laughs> pictures as I talk, but me doing two things at the same time is really not a, not a great thing. But you can see some 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 photographs from the day, some headlines from newspapers from different parts of the country about services being closed. Um, 
um, folks wearing masks and uh, makeshift hospitals. But uh, A.B. Lipscomb, one of the editors of the Gospel Advocate, said that the, the influenza pandemic opened up a way for the enlargement of the sympathies of Christian people. You see, Christians looked at this tragic situation as an opportunity, an opportunity to be the hands of Jesus in their communities, to approach others with the love of Christ. And I, I think what a, what a great and powerful witness they have left for us, their descendants. And I pray that we will live up to that testimony, that we will shoulder these difficulties with grace, that we will um, open up our hearts, right, to the, to the needs of those around us. And um, we could spend the whole time complaining, right? It's really easy to do. But what a blessing it is when we can approach this situation with the eyes of Christ. And so the Philippian letter, very uh, similar, very, very interesting that, that Paul in Acts chapter 16, Paul, Silas and their companions, uh, as a response to a dream, to a vision that Paul had in the night of a man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. They had, they had tried to go into Mycenae. They had tried to go into some other areas that they thought they needed uh, the gospel. But yet this, this Macedonian call came to him um, from, from this lower province of Greece, from Europe, and said, come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul knew that there were those there who were receptive to the gospel. And so, so they, they first went to the city of Philippi, a Roman, a Roman colony, and um, met with some women, a lady named Lydia, and some women who were meeting to worship God. And, and uh, they, the Lord's people uh, were, were, were gathered together there, and the church was born, and um, people were coming to Christ. And in the midst of it, as so often happened, there was controversy, and Paul and Silas wound up being put in jail, wrongly accused, of course. And um, so here they are, in all of this that God has done, now they're in jail. So what they could have taken that situation and complained, they could have taken that situation and asked God, why are you allowing this to happen to us? Uh, what's going to become of the church now? Oh, it's the end for sure, right? They didn't do that. They spent their time in prison singing and praising God. And long story short, God moved in a miraculous way. The jailer and his household were converted. Many, many people came to Christ, and that church grew, and that church thrived, and that church became a, a point of where other churches were established as a result of them. And so what, a, what an amazing beginning that the church in Europe had, right? But fast forward now. Years ahead, Paul is once again in jail. He is once again in prison, in a Roman prison. And who is he thinking about? He's thinking about his friends, his, his, his family in Christ, in Philippi. He's got to be remembering how he was in, in chains for Christ there as well. And so he writes to them and encourages them. And he wants them to know that the same God who opened up those cells, those prison cells so many years before, would open a way, would make a way, and that he's still in the midst of it all. He still had joy. So that's the, the title I've used for the sermon series, I've, I Still Have Joy. It's like the, uh, the song that, 
uh, spiritual that we used to sing. I still have joy. I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, I still have joy. You can sing that together because you'll do a lot better job than I just did. But isn't that, isn't that powerful? That no matter what, Paul knew and rejoiced in the power and the love of God. In verses seven and eight of chapter one of Philippians, he says, he says this, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He loved God's people and he loved uh, the, the, the ministry of, of Christ and he loved the gospel of Christ. And, and he lets them know with these words just how much that they meant to him. And he talks about this joy that he has experienced and that he continues to experience. So a lot of times we think about joy, we equate joy with with happiness. We think they're, they're synonyms and they're really not because happiness, the, the word happy is, is uh, the root of that is, is happen, right? So happiness is that positive, that good feeling based upon what is happening based upon the situation. Something is making me happy. Oh, I get to, to go to Disney. It makes me happy. That's really a, not a good example for me because it really doesn't make me happy. Sorry, but um, I, I got to eat ice cream today. That made me happy. I got to see my family today. That made me happy. That was a circumstance. But circumstances are not permanent, are they? Circumstances change, circumstances evolve, and they can change quickly, just like that. So he's not, he doesn't use the word happy. He uses this word joy, and he uses this word rejoice. Joy is different from happiness because joy is permanent. Joy in Galatians chapter 5 is listed as a fruit of the Holy Spirit, a product of the Holy Spirit. It comes from God. It is permanent. And, you know, just like I, I can choose to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, right? Even though the, the Holy Spirit comes from God, he is the gift given to me when I'm baptized into Christ. He, he, he works in me, but I, I have to cooperate with the Spirit. So I'm told to keep in step with the Spirit. Joy is a gift of the Spirit. I can choose to develop that gift. I can choose to have joy. And so um, today, that's what we're talking about. I choose joy. No matter what the circumstance is, I choose to have joy. Well, how do I do that? That's the important part. I think in chapter one, Paul gives us gives us several very good, very good suggestions for how we can have joy. The first one, uh, I think, is this. Adopt a gospel perspective. Perspective is the way we see things. And gospel is good news. Adopt a good news perspective. Adopt a perspective that's aligned with the gospel. In verses 12 and 14, He's talking to um, he's talking to them about the things that have happened, right? And and, and as, as a part of that, he says, you know, there are even people, uh, brothers of ours, who are trying to stir up trouble for me, who are jealous of me, or 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 whatever, and they're trying to stir up trouble, and so so they they preach Christ out of jealousy, and they preach Christ out of envy of me, and his response to that is so awesome. He says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Now, I'll be honest with y'all. I'm not, I'm not good at that. I, that hits me over the head because uh, I struggle with, with 
uh, folks who try to do damage to other people who are critical. I struggle with those who are uh, competitive with the faith as if it's some sort of a contest, right? And so uh, that really irritates me, to be quite honest with you. But what Paul said is true. What does it matter? As long as Christ is being preached, that's what's important. That's the gospel perspective. That's the perspective that I have to that I have to work to adopt, right? That I have to work to 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 make sure is is taking place in my life because God is what is important and Christ's message is what is truly important. His message being preached so that people can come to him and have salvation. That's what matters. Adopt a gospel perspective. And the next thing I think uh, that he's trying to tell us, we skip down to verses 20 and 21. Always exalt Christ in whatever you do, in whatever happens, whatever circumstance. Remember, I'm here to exalt Jesus Christ. That's why I'm here. That's what this is all about, right? I'm going to move this up here. I think it might be easier. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, there's that word, always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is an attitude of exaltation. No matter what, if, if God chooses to allow me to live and to continue here on this earth, I will continue to preach him. That's what Paul's letting us know. He'll continue to serve him, to live for him, to go where he sends, and to do what he commands. Um, and if he chooses to end this for me now, to to, for, for this to be the end of my walk here on earth, then I'll just gain heaven. I will gain Christ and be with him. That's a powerful perspective, right? Always exalt Christ. If that's what my goal is, the situations lose their power. The trials begin to lose their power over me because my goal is to exalt Christ. And there is no situation that I will that I will uh, be confronted with that I can't exalt Christ in, and that's what He wants us to know. And then, sort of springing off of that, He says this: Act on opportunities that God provides. If I have a gospel perspective, that that what's important is that the good news is preached. If I'm always trying to exalt Christ in my life, in, in everything that I do, then I'm going to act on whatever opportunity God provides. Philippian Church was born because God closed doors to other places and opened a door into Macedonia. And so if I will act on what opportunities God does provide instead of maybe complaining about those that I don't think he's providing to me, a lot can change in my life. He sort of continues that thought that he, that he started in uh, verses 20 through 21, and he says this, If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire, he wanted this, I desire to depart and be with Christ. That's what I want, which is better by far. Absolutely, right? But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Look, I, um, our ultimate goal for all believers is to be with Christ forever and ever. The new heaven, the new earth, where, where there is no more sorrow, where there is no more disease, where there is no more death. 
that's what we want. That's what we aim for. That's what we what we live for to be with Christ. But while we're here, we have a function. And God has chosen for us to be here. Wherever you are, God has chosen for you to be here at this time, at this place, as Esther said, for such a time as this. We are appointed by God to be his ambassadors. So Paul said, I know what's better for you is that I continue here to lead and to guide and to preach the good news of Jesus. So the opportunities that God provides, I'm going to act on those opportunities, no matter what those opportunities happen to be. I'll tell you, I I want to brag on Joe for a minute. Joe, uh, Joe Richmond, one of our shepherds, he is a guy who... He's a can-do person, right? He, he, he's always thinking of ways to accomplish things. He's got a great mind for that. I love how Joe uh, immediately goes into action. Um, that last time we gathered together and we were trying to figure out how to do it, Joe worked out a system so that we could honor God and take the Lord's Supper and remain remain safe. And he continues to do that. And, and he meets folks there. And some of y'all met with him t- uh, yesterday at the at the church building. And he, he found a way to provide people with hand sanitizer and communion supplies and even keeps toilet paper if you need it. He's taken the situation and used the opportunities, saw that with a gospel perspective, exalting Christ by acting on opportunities that God provides. What a blessing he is to our lives. And I think that's what Paul was trying to teach us all to do. Take advantage of the opportunities. We can focus on the negative. I'm telling you, um, there's so much negative in social media and um, the, 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 the media, the news. And, and if, if we focus on that too much, it can really bring us down. And, and, and it's tempting to become negative and critical of everyone around us. I find myself self doing the same thing, you know. Um, but is that, how does that make me any different from the world? We have the greatest hope ever offered to humankind in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know, brothers and sisters, that if the earthly tabernacle that we live in is destroyed, we have a temple not made by human hands in the heavens. And I know, I believe with all of my heart that one day we will all be together. We won't have to worry about it anymore. There will be no more sickness, no more dying, no more death. But what there will be then is perfect love. And you know what? We're blessed with love now, with the love of Christ that fills our hearts, that fills our our, our minds with hope. And I am so filled with hope today as I think about each of you. And um, I know that we will be together soon. Um, I believe that, that that will happen very soon. But in the meantime, I still have joy. And I know you still have joy. So wherever you are as you're, as you're listening to this right now, um, I want you to sing that with me. We sing that simple song with me. I still have joy. I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, Lord, I still have joy. 
I still have joy. I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, I still have joy. We still have joy. And I am so glad that we do. Before we before we finish uh, this morning, I want to I want to let you know that we will be having Bible study um, on Thursday evenings. I'm going to do a, a study of Philippians and uh, on Thursdays at seven o'clock on Facebook Live. We will send out a, uh, a link for you to access that and um, where we'll be able to uh, make comments and and um, and study the word together. I have missed our times together, but um, we'll do the best we can in the meantime. After all the things I've been through, remember, I still have joy, and you and I still have joy today. And I thank you for being my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I pray that God blesses you richly this week. Take care.